uh, well, uh, it's our great pleasure to have Miguel Angelos as uh, our second uh, speaker in the summer school. Thank Miguel for coming. Uh, actually, we invited Miguel for the first summer school as well, but uh, well, it didn't happen finally. So I'm so happy that Miguel finally, I mean, uh, pleasure to be here. He's here. Thank you so much, Miguel. So Miguel uh, received his PhD degree from the University of Waterloo in 2001. So he has been uh, with the Department of Management Science at the University of Waterloo since 2004, became as an associate professor in 2007, and was associate chair for graduate studies and research from 2007 to 2009. He has crossed appointed since 2004 to the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. His research interests are in optimization, and he is uh, particularly interested in its applications to energy problems. He has worked on industrial research projects in revenue management, sponsored by British Midland Airways, network planning. Uh, yeah, he has been awarded as Humboldt Research Fellowship for experienced researchers for 2009 and 2010. Miguel is an associate editor of Discrete Applied Mathematics and a member of editorial board of optimization and engineering. I know also Miguel is an uh, editor for IEEE transactions on power systems. He's also a member of the research review committee of MITAX, I think. Hope I pronounced it well. Yeah. Good. Uh, thank you, Miguel, for coming. So the stage is yours. So, yeah. So Miguel will talk about introduction to optimization energy till half past 12, so 10.45, we will have a break, coffee break for uh, 15 minutes. Well, okay. thank you. Thank you, Jalal. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. As Jalal mentioned, uh, we've tried to figure out ways for me to come here. So it's, uh, it's good to, to be attending and presenting at the summer school. Um, I'm sorry to say that biography is a little bit out of date. I'm now in Montreal, um, and I have uh, what's called an industrial research chair with Hydro-Quebec and Schneider Electric. And one of the really interesting things about having uh, a chair like this is that you get to work directly with these companies. And you get to work on problems that are relevant to them and you get to use data from them, which is, we've talked about data already uh, when Pierre was presenting. So, so it's really a lot of fun to do that. Uh, and then I, I also have a close collaboration with INRIA in France uh, on the whole energy side of things as well. This is a first lecture, or second presentation in the, in the context of the summer school, and we're talking about energy systems and modern optimization energy systems. Uh, one, and so one, one thing that I want to do is first talk a little bit about energy systems. Where are we at? Pierre kind of hinted that not that long ago, things were pretty quiet in terms of power systems, and now it's very active. So, so there's been a big change. Um, then I want to talk about optimization models, and because I wanted to make an introductory presentation and do different ways of doing optimization, I picked one problem, namely the unit commitment problem, and I'm going to go through different ways of applying optimization, different kinds of optimization to that problem. Uh, and then at the end, I want to talk a little bit about a market-related uh, problem of looking for what are called logic constraint equilibria uh, with a specific interest of incorporating storage in power systems. So that's, uh, that's something that's more recent in terms of research. So why study energy systems? Uh, we could go around the room and each, and each one of you could take the microphone in turn and uh, tell me why you're here and why you're interested in energy systems. Uh, you actually did that beforehand, so I had a chance to read your responses and, and get a feel for uh, why you're here. Uh, but why in general do we study energy systems? Why does DTU invest so much on research in energy systems? I think one first part of the answer is that this is crucial. Energy is vital for our survival. Uh, you will probably have difficulty counting the number of times since you got up this morning that you've done something or benefited from something that involved energy. If nothing else, getting here from where you're staying. So energy really is fundamental to just about every activity that we do. Um, and when the supply fails, we notice it. And usually there's a crisis. So energy really is fundamental. 
Uh, yet, not that long ago, in power systems, uh, there was not much research activity. So in a sense, and in, in probably even in other areas as well, so in a sense, we were taking this for granted. So what has changed? Well, what has changed is uh, at least one of the changes is that there's a greater awareness of the impact of energy acquisition, particularly in the environment. Uh, there's a lot of talk about air pollution in various places around the world. Uh, and there was a recent estimate in the BBC mentioned that five and a half million people die each year because of air pollution. Okay. And this is mostly related to energy in different ways. Uh, there's even people who have pollution, air pollution at home because they have to use wood or coal to cook inside their homes. So this is seriously hazardous for health. And energy acquisition in general, if it's not done properly, is hazardous. And of course now there's a lot of talk about carbon emissions. Uh, and in Canada we had a study uh, a few years ago about the Trotti Energy Futures Project. Uh, you can read all the report here in this uh, link. All the links in my presentation, by the way, are clickable. So if you click on them, it'll take you to the, to the website. Uh, and there's a video of a, pre a release of the report that we did at Polytechnique Montreal to, uh, to highlight the results. And basically the results are that if Canada wants to be serious about reducing its GHG emissions, it's not going to be easy. And I think that's true not just for Canada, but for other places as well. Uh, but the, the, what, the study really went into a lot of specifics of what's so hard about it. Okay. So if we're talking about energy systems, we have to talk about these issues as well and the economic and social impacts that it has. And then at least, I think for me, and hopefully for many of you here, this is an interesting topic. This is really a fun topic to work in. Um, the North American power system has been described as the biggest machine in the world because it really interconnects a tremendous number of components that all have to work together in sync, quasi instantaneously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When you think about it, it really is a huge achievement the power systems that we have. So while we want to make changes and we want to integrate more renewables and we want to have smart cities and smart homes and all these great developments, we also have to be very careful when we start making changes about the impact that they can have on what is still a very well working system and a fantastic system when you think about it. It doesn't mean we shouldn't improve it, but we have to be very careful how we do these things. If we then think about issues like distributed generation, so renewables and the whole idea of demand management that touches also on the heat aspect that, uh, that Pierre was mentioning, uh, doing these kinds of things is going to increase the complexity of the system quite a lot. So it's a big challenge to do that and do it in a way that maintains the reliability of the system and the sustainability of the system. Uh, and like I mentioned, it's a huge challenge to develop renewable or decarbonized supply. We have to integrate these renewables. We have to use storage to answer a number of these challenges. And storage is something that's still very much in the development. So we have quite a few years ahead that I think will be very exciting in that respect. Basically, especially with all these changes, there's a long-standing question that remains, which is how do you do this most efficiently? How do you do this at minimum cost? But cost can take different ways of measuring it, right? We're not just talking necessarily about money. We talk about other costs and other impacts that the system has. Okay. So this is still, this is a very exciting time to be working in this area. There's a lot of interesting stuff happening. Uh, and in particular, we talk a lot about electricity and, and electricity is key, but there are other parts to the energy system. There's, a, there's gas that was already mentioned. There's hydrogen, oil, coal, biofuels, heat, uh, and there's probably more that could be added to the list. Okay. And somehow this all has to work together. Okay. So it touches on, on some of what uh, Pierre was mentioning in his uh, presentation. Speaking of oil, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that oil is not going away tomorrow. Much as though some people would like that uh, and there would be benefits in doing so. Uh, 
consumption of oil is still going up. There's no peak oil demand in sight. What's slowing down, according to the IEA uh, in its most up-to-date information, is the derivative. Okay? It's still going up, but the derivative is slowing down. Okay? And of course, the expectation is that it's going to eventually start decreasing. But it's still around, and it's still important. And if we look in terms of, even of research, uh, there's a lot of research going on. You can go to the special issue of optimization engineering that has a whole bunch of papers on research in oil and gas. Up to date. I mean, what's happening now? Uh, we've probably all heard about shale gas and all the developments in shale oil and all the developments that are happening in that area. So it's not about to go away. Okay? Um, and there are some challenges in that area as well. There's a question, so I get to throw this for the first time. Please, yes. Okay. Um, yes, you mentioned that um, Canada had this report about um, how to re reduce their CO2 emissions, for example. Yes. Does this include CO2 emissions that um, arise abroad from the hydrocarbon exports, the Canadian sh um, tide shale exports, for example? That's a good question. Um, the answer is no because the way emissions are counted is that you count emissions that are made in your jurisdiction. So if I extract oil and sell it, the emissions are counted where it's burnt. However, you do count the emissions from extracting it. And in Canada, those are not trivial. It's actually a lot of work to extract oil in, 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 in Canada. So in some sense, yes and no, but, but the answer specifically to your question, I think it's no. Uh, it's, it's who consumes the oil that gets to count the emissions. So if you add those, it's even worse. <laughs> that would be the, the, the answer to the question. Even without those, it's a big challenge in Canada. All right? Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay. All right. Thank you. This has got to be the most sportive summer school that I've taught in so far. So it's a lot of fun. So, so the point here was to mention that oil and gas is not going away, and there are its own issues there, uh, and, uh, and some challenges and exciting developments. And this comes up if you look at the energy mix in different countries. You see that things can really be very different. Uh, the first one that I've put up is Denmark, which is where we are. Um, Try to get this guy straight. Um, so if we look at electricity generation, this is just one snapshot that I took from the IEA's uh, information, which there's loads of it on their website. Uh, Denmark, as Pierre mentioned, is doing incredibly well. It says here's 63% of renewables. This is a, as of 2016, if I recall, a uh, global mix for the energy. So renewables are a big part of the pie. But look, there's still oil and gas and coal. Okay. So, even in Denmark, which is really quite a leader in this area, we have to acknowledge the, the use of other sorts of energy as well. Uh, if we look at the share of renewables, we have wind that has quite a lot of it. In fact, it has the bulk of it, along with biofuels and waste. Um, if we look at Canada, which is where I'm from, we get a very different pie. We still have a lot of renewables, but it's hydro that takes the bulk of it. Okay. So in Canada, we're blessed to have loads and loads of hydro, which, uh, which is a big advantage. But still, we have coal and gas and oil in some percentage, and we also have a big chunk of nuclear. Okay. Whether you count nuclear as renewable or not is a discussion that we can have offline. Uh, it depends who you ask, and it depends on what your measure of renewable is. Um, but we also have to keep in mind that the more options we turn down, the bigger the challenge is to decarbonize the system. And nuclear has its own serious disadvantages, but it is a way to generate a lot of non-carbon emitting energy. Okay. And that's something else that comes up in this area is that there's a lot of trade-offs. Uh, if, if you want to have an advantage in one respect, you're probably going to have to pay the price in another respect. And, and these involve a lot of uh, societal 
trade-offs on how we do these things. Uh, yes, let's do this again. Uh, picture in Denmark. I'm, I'm just yeah, wondering. I can go uh, back here. I'm assuming this is generation. Uh, what about consumption? Because I'm assuming they have connections with Germany or big connections. I don't know if Denmark is a net importer or exporter of energy, and if it's importing from Germany, could import coal emissions. Let's call it. That that that's a good question. Um, this is this is about electricity generation in Denmark. So I don't know what the picture in the in on in terms of exchanges is exactly. Uh, I know that there are interconnections to some neighbors, uh, but the amount to what they re you know what they represent in terms of consumption, there are people here uh, like uh, Jalal and Pierre and Spiros who I'm sure will be more informed than I am in that respect. But that's a good question. This is generation in the country, which is sort of related to the previous question of do you count what happened, you know, where do you draw the line between one country and the other? And in some sense, that line almost shouldn't be there because we're all integrated in terms of energy. We're all integrated in terms of carbon emissions. So we really need to look at the big picture. But the same way that with that nice global solution for electricity, gas, and heat, then you say, oops, regulation doesn't let you do it. Here we have the problem that we're still dealing with more than 150 nations around the world. And there are limitations on how far you can go. So you have to acknowledge that. Anybody else? I'm going to be a pro at this by the time we get to lunch. All right. So this is, these, these, the, the reason I wanted to put this at the beginning of my presentation is just to point out that energy is complex, okay? And it depends on where you are, it depends on the circumstances, it depends on the objectives that you have, and it's always a trade-off. It really is always a trade-off. There's no magic solution in this area. In Canada, as I was saying, our big endowment is in terms of hydro. Uh, there's a big investment in nuclear and then a little bit of, of, of a few others. And then looking at another country, I decided to pick from among the participants the furthest from Denmark, okay? Those who have traveled the longest to be here, and we have three people from Australia in the group. Um, very different pie, very, very different pie. And in particular, you see a lot of coal. Um, and I didn't mean to pick on Australia because of this, but it is interesting because it shows a very different kind of pie, okay? A lot of coal, a lot of gas, a lot of oil, a smaller share of renewables here, very uh, diverse in terms of where it comes from. Um, so just different, right? And if you want to think in terms of reducing GHG emissions, what you would do in a place like Australia is very different from what you would do in Canada. And probably different from what you would do in Denmark, okay? Because it also has to do with the availability of resources. So there's no one size fits all. There's no magic bullet that's going to solve all the problems. And this is one of the reasons why it makes optimization a very good tool to use. Because in, if you use an optimization approach, you can model a lot of ways to make these trade-offs, one of which is to use markets. Uh, you can integrate regulatory requirements. You can integrate guidelines that you want to follow to make it acceptable to society. Because another thing to keep in mind as well is that you can have the best technical solution ever. If you can't convince people to follow, it's not going to happen. Okay? We need technological excellence, but we also need societal awareness and acceptance for technological solutions to work. So very important to keep that in mind, and that will depend on the context. You know. Now, having said all this, uh, the focus that I want to talk about today, and I think a lot of the focus in this, uh, in this summer school is going to be on electricity, and electricity has its own specific challenges. One of them is that supply and consumption have to match. And they have to match all the time. And that means on a second by second basis or less, 
all the way to long term. Okay, we have to make sure that we have enough capacity to generate electricity uh, even in the future. And because you're mixing very different timescales, this is another aspect that makes the problem very hard. Mixing timescales and always maintaining balance. It's, uh, it makes it uh, have its own challenges. One of the promising aspects for the future is storage. Storage provides a lot of what we call flexibility. It essentially allows you to shift electricity in time, if you want to think of it in a very simplistic way. So it helps address this issue of matching exactly at every point in time. On the other hand, it is still a challenge to store electricity in large quantities. Okay? So we're not quite at the point where we can say storage is going to solve all our problems, but it is becoming an important ingredient in how to make things work. So how do we deal with this? Well, this is a general idea for how we deal with complex, difficult problems. We cut it up in pieces and we deal with the pieces separately. Okay. So we divide the big problem into sub-problems and we work on those sub-problems. And some of them were already mentioned. Uh, if we go on a very almost instantaneous basis, uh, we look at what's called dynamic frequency response. There's not a lot of optimization you can do here. This has to be essentially automatic systems that react to, to keep, uh, keep things going. When you do have an unforeseen condition, uh, a line that trips, a generator that disappears, or some major fluctuation in the renewables, then you have to have what's called reserve. And that has to kick in to within a few minutes to keep the system going. Uh, again, it's a little bit difficult to, to optimize at that scale. What you can optimize is make sure you have enough reserve to kick in at that point. Okay? So you have to keep these things in mind. You don't optimize at this level, but you have to know that it's there if you want your solutions to work. Where we start getting into optimization is at the level of you know, planning half an hour, 15 minutes, maybe up to an hour ahead. And here we start looking at dispatch problems. We start looking at optimal power flow. Uh, as Pierre mentioned, this is an area that's getting a lot of attention right now. Uh, we want to solve, we knew how to do power flow before. But now we want to solve bigger instances, more complex instances, instances with uncertainty, with renewables, with storage. Uh, you, can, you can make these problems much more complex than they used to be. And then they become uh, a challenge. And they are still a challenge. And there'll be presentations later on in the week talking about uh, OPF. If we go further, we can look at a day ahead problem, which is typically the unit commitment problem. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, now that means that I have my system and I want to plan for tomorrow. And I want to make sure that I have enough generation at hand to meet demand. Now, what's the demand tomorrow? Well, we get into the issue of forecasting that was already mentioned. Okay. So do I know what tomorrow will be? Well, to some extent, yes. To some extent, no. So now I have to integrate uncertainty in my optimization to make that work. Okay. If we go further than looking a day ahead, we can look at problems that have to do with week or year. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's long-term issues about providing enough capacity in, in markets in the longer terms and so on. But there is a problem that doesn't get mentioned a lot. And yet, when you talk to people who are on the ground, they talk a lot about, which is maintenance. There's a lot of equipment around that's reached or almost reached its expected useful life. And maintenance is very expensive. Maintenance doesn't really make you any money if you're a company. It's something you have to do. But if you don't do it, and if you don't uh, take care of your equipment, it's going to really bite you at some point. So how do you manage the maintenance-related issues in the system is becoming more and more a real pressing need for companies. And in some cases, there's very little research that's been done in these problems. So that's something that, uh, that I and some of the uh, students working with me in Canada are looking at, is issues of planning maintenance, integrating maintenance in the operations, and all these general questions. 
And they're not the sexiest around, but they really are critical for the companies on their, on their uh, operational basis. And then looking even further, if we talk in multi-year horizons, we look at expansion planning. Do we have enough generation for the next decade or the next few decades? Do we have enough transmission? Do we have enough distribution? Can we get authorization for new lines? And all these longer, more complicated questions. Okay. So it really shifts a lot. And of course, optimization kicks in as I was saying, if you're looking maybe 15 minutes ahead or more, um, all the way to, to longer. Okay. There's another question, so here we go again. For the maintenance part, I was wondering what kind of questions you are looking at. Is it how often or when during the year or if at all? That's, uh, okay, that, that's a good question. There's actually two parts to maintenance. There's what one might call urgent maintenance, which is if I don't do it very soon, I'm going to have a serious problem. And there's m longer term, you know, do I change something this year or next year or the year after? Um, so depending on which one you're looking at, things are a little bit different, but they're also related because the decisions you do in the short term or the decisions you have to do in the short term will have an impact on what you do in the long term. So, so one, one of the main projects that I'm looking at in this area is essentially trying to optimize the two at the same time. To say, especially in the context, for example, of Quebec, uh, where, where Montreal is, uh, there's very little maintenance you can do in winter. And being a northern area, at least half the year is winter. So you can only plan maintenance for at most six months, maybe a little bit less. And you only have so many people available, so many resources available. The distances are very long. So if you send a team to a particular area, you want them to be there for a while. You don't want them to just do something small and have to fly all the way somewhere else. So there's geographical constraints to maximize the use of your time. Um, and then there's budget constraints in terms of resources available, and then different priorities in your, in your maintenance. So it's like a very complex scheduling problem, if you want to think of it that way. Yes, uh, the other way around. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, great to see uh, set up in terms of time scales. And uh, I wanted to ask, uh, about flexibility and uh, well let's say 10 years from now mm -hmm. how much of a change do you expect and all of that and specifically about g optimal power flows getting towards shorter time scales and maybe overlapping not with seconds but maybe getting to minute closer closer oh. to there yes um, well I mean that that's that's a very broad question I think I think that I mean we would I think that, especially in a context where you have markets, you would like to be able to solve a fairly complicated, um, mathematically complicated power flow within a few minutes. Because if you want to clear the market every 15 minutes, you have to do it in less than 15 minutes. How much you want to integrate at that scale, well, in some sense, the more the better, but it becomes challenging. Um, if you have storage, it, then it becomes a question of to what extent can storage smooth out this process. But also it's going to have an impact on the market. So, but yeah. We're getting much better in optimization. Right? We're getting much better in optimization. And we but can the, potentially do it much faster. That would be great, yeah. On the other hand, um, I think that historically what happens is that if people say, oh, I can do power flow, I'm picking on power flow in two hours, then they'll say, great, now can you do this more complicated power flow? And or can you do it faster and so on? So it starts getting more and more. But, but that's a good point. I mean, the more, the more we can do, the more impact optimization can have in the operational part of the system. And it's, it's a big challenge because depending on the utility, there's more or less optimization being used. And you have to convince the people at the companies, especially the people that are on the ground, that not only can you do it fast enough for them, but that they can trust the results of your optimization. 
And that's probably the harder part, that it has to be reliable, it has to be robust. Robust in the sense that they can trust the tool to give an answer. And that robustness is probably the biggest challenge. Because if you fail once, you can lose their trust. So it's, uh, it's tricky. I don't know if that answers the question. Well, it, it certainly gives a very good head point to me for my discussion. Okay, okay. Good, good. So you can uh, pick up on that. We could, we could spend a lot of time on any of these topics, of course. So uh, I'm, I'm focusing more on giving an overview. But uh, yeah, there'll be lots of time this week with other presentations to pick up on that. There's a question at the back. This one's going to be a challenge. <laughs> I'll, I'll, actually, I'll try maybe a little bit closer so I don't hit the equipment at the back. <laughs> There we go. Thank you. Um, I was wondering which specific problems uh, that were solved previously with the DC model yes. now uh, requires more complex models because I saw uh, in the previous uh, presentation that the DC model was not enough. Right. Um, so when do, you, when do you absolutely need AC or when you really would like to have AC instead of DC? Um, I think a short way to answer the question is when the issues of reactive power kick in. Meaning when, because when you do a DC approximation you essentially wave the whole issue of reactive power out of the picture. So the question is when does this cause difficulties in matching your solution to reality. Okay. And one of them is actually in Canada. Um, if I skip, uh, by the way, I have way too many slides for the time that I have. Uh, the reason I have so many slides is because this way you can have them and, and read them later uh, yourself. We'll do what we do in three hours and, uh, and then we can have discussions afterwards. Okay. My, my objective is really just to set the ta set the table in some sense, and then the other presenters can, can pick up on that. Uh, but let me move forward a fair bit here to a picture, this one here. This is a picture of Quebec, and uh, this is part of Canada, so N Vermont is here, New York City is somewhere down here on the board. Um, this is Montreal. This is uh, the, the biggest city in Quebec, this whole area here. And this is the St. Lawrence River. Most of the population is along the river here. There's Ottawa, which is the capital that's a little bit over here. So, you know, you've got essentially all the load down here. Then you have exports. But the interconnections for exports are also all down here. Because the population is for the south into the U.S. and and a bit into the province of Ontario here on the, on the left. Okay, so that's where you have to get the power to. Now where's the power coming from? Up, 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 okay. Much of the power is in this area here, which is the La Grande complex, okay. It's all hydro, large scale hydro dams. Uh, there's a big chunk of it here as well, in this area here. And then there's a new development over here in the east. Okay? And there's actually one of it in Newfoundland here at the Churchill complex, uh, which is a whole different story, but essentially it counts for the, for the Quebec system. So the distance between where much of this generation is and much of the load is, is in the hundreds of kilometers. Yeah. In, in some cases up here, it's more than a thousand kilometers. So if you ignore issues of reactive power, you're going to have a problem. Okay. So if you look at approximating this system, you have to use AC. Okay. None of these links are HVDC, by the way. Okay. There's an HVDC line coming soon, um, but none of this is HVDC. So you really have to take the full AC into account. Uh, and this connects to... Um, the question that Misha was asking before, this scale of power flow with the kind of restrictions that they have in the system, basically they've never found the tool that they trust. 
and they develop, they have their own guidelines and ways of operating that they know work for their system, right? But they haven't got a tool yet that they trust enough to, to use for their system. Um, and I've taken that as a little bit of a personal challenge as part of my research with them to develop a tool that will assist them in running the system. I think that to aim to do a tool right away that would do everything is a big jump from where they are now. But if we can get some optimization into the control room, I think that would be a big step forward because this system has very peculiar um, features that many other systems don't have. It's also not very meshed at all. Okay? Uh, if you look at the picture, there's very few links horizontally, right? It's just a bunch of very long lines from north to south. Very challenging to operate in general. And if you lose one line at the wrong time of the year, you are in big trouble. Big, big trouble. Any other questions? Okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> Is there another question? Maybe in two steps, yeah, yeah. it'll be safer. Oh, there's a question there. There we go. This is really fun. I love this microphone. In transmission lines also uh, horizontally, like uh, for... So what's the question again? Uh, related to the last thing you said about how the transmission is done in uh, Quebec. Yes. Are there some plans for expansion to increase like the... Um, reliability of the systems, we're having more interconnections between the generation capacities. Are there plans for expansion? Um, well, if there's plans for expansion, the answer is yes. Whether they can be accomplished is a different question. And this is what I mean. Um, I was talking about societal acceptance earlier. It's very difficult to build a line these days, at least in Quebec and in many places as well. Um, people just don't want you to build lines. Now, to mitigate that comment a little bit, constructing up here is actually not that hard. And the reason for that is that there is already an agreement in place. There's a template agreement that was made with the people who live in that big area that essentially sets the rules for how to build lines. So if Hydro-Quebec wanted to build a line horizontally, uh, it probably could without too much difficulty. However, the real question is not only expansion, but expansion where you most need it, right? If you're going to invest as a company, you think about where is the most profitable place to invest. And the real needs are down here because we don't have enough interconnections to export to, to, uh, to the markets outside of Quebec. This gets into the question of how the whole electricity is priced in Quebec, which is a separate um, discussion. But where they really want to build is down here. And then it gets hard, because here you have people who live there and are not part of this template agreement. And then when you cross the border, you have the difficulties in the US. And right now, uh, in the last few months, Hydro-Quebec has signed a contract with Massachusetts to export a large quantity of electricity over a couple of decades. Massachusetts wants it, Quebec wants to sell it, but the question is who's going to let them build the line? And the initial project was to go through New Hampshire, which is not quite marked on the map, but it's this little bit here. And that project got turned down by the authorities in New Hampshire. So now they're on to plan B and maybe plan C to get a line through. So this is where the societal acceptance comes in. Even if you want it, even if both parties want it and you have the money to do it, you still have to get acceptance. And that's a big challenge. So expansion is not easy on multiple counts. And not just the capital investment cost, but also the can you get it built? Question. Okay. 
Well, there's, I think he shortcutted you with oh, the microphone. Sorry. We'll get here. <laughs> we'll get here. Uh, I had a much uh, quick and broader question. Uh, can you just give us some insight about how the Canadian transmission system is done? Because in the US, you have the Western interconnect and the Eastern interconnect. Mm -hmm. and, uh, just wanted to get a feel of that from the Canadian perspective. Mm -hmm. The Canadian perspective on that is that it is, um, there is no Canadian grid. Canada is a very large country and there's actually very, and not just in electricity, very limited trading east-west. Okay? Quebec's trading partners are the US in the south. Ontario's is the US in the south. And you keep going that way, right? The US is the big trading partner even for electricity. So there is no Canadian grid per se. Now, the second aspect is that energy is done provincially, which is a little bit like the states in Australia and the US. So each province has a big say on how the system works and is set up. And there's very limited collaboration. So it's all done on a province by province basis. Uh, you know, I can ask a follow up question. Sure. And, and then we'll the come here. Uh, what is, is, is energy security in each, uh, is, there a, is energy security a provincial goal uh, in Canada? Like each province has to be energy secured or is there a goal or any target for that or how is it? Because it is disconnected as you said. Right. So, so if we talk about energy security, um, the first part to the answer is that it is on a province by province basis, um, essentially. Now, I'm, I'm simplifying a lot of things, but essentially it's a province by province basis. The second part of that answer is that Canada is so blessed with energy that energy security is not an issue. The issue is getting the energy you know, produced and transported and so on. Uh, and one of the issues that's been in the news a lot for the past several months, maybe a couple of years, is the fact that there is a lot of oil in the west of the country, but instead of building a pipeline to bring it to the east, we sell it to the US with the available pipelines and we import from Middle East, South America, whatever, to the east of the country. Now, if there was a problem, like there was in the 70s, when there was a crisis in the 70s, Canada can get its act together and actually be energy sufficient. But right now, it is this patchwork of provincial jurisdictions, and the way it works is not necessarily optimal for the country as a whole. But energy security in Canada really is not an issue. And that's why we can afford all these squabbles. Okay, uh, right? We'll, t we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. uh, I remember last, last year we had a talk from a guy in, in Edinburgh, from a guy that worked in an operations room in Germany. Mm -hmm. It was part kind of, uh, I'm guessing, the, from the TSO. And his job looked very hectic. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because uh, in what he was doing, and it was a little bit of unit commitment mm -hmm. as, as a part of it, optimization was not really a thing. It, and he told that in industry, he basically used three things. First, Excel spreadsheets. Second, telephone. And third, uh, uh, experience. And that was basically the, the way of managing. So my question is, if that is really the case everywhere, I don't know, uh, when do you think optimization will start coming to those, to those things? He told that even they have these projects of optimization, but they don't trust them, and basically they all do optimizations. You're in industry, uh, con contact, what, what's your input on that? that that's, that's a very good question, and again, it connects to some of the other questions from before. Yeah, from somewhere else. Um, <laughs> It is very hectic to run a transmission system. Certainly the same is true in Quebec. I don't know, I don't know about everywhere else, but I suspect that it is. Um, part of the challenge is that you don't have a lot of time to react, right? If we get back to the timing 
slide that I had before, you know, if something happens, you have at best a few minutes because the automated devices do the, the second stuff, but you have a few minutes to react. Mostly they work with experience and they work with solutions that are worked out in advance. So I'm making this up, but the idea is you have a map like this and if the red light goes on for say this line here, then you literally flip to the page of the book that says, here's what to do, and you do it. You don't think, you don't question, you don't optimize, you just do what's on that page. So it's all worked out in advance. Okay. Now, if you do this, I think optimization could help figure out what you should put on that page. I'm not saying it would give you the answer, but hopefully in advance you can run scenarios and, and try to come up with a good reaction to what should be on that emergency reaction, right? But when it comes to the actual operating, this is basically the way it is. And if you're gonna have an optimization tool, it has to be quick and it has to be trusted. And that's the challenge. Uh, and this connects to my previous comment of, I think to say, I'm gonna go in and give them a tool that's gonna run the system for them is probably delirious as, as an idea. But what I would like to do is to bring in a tool that can help them. And mostly it would be a tool that would work in parallel with the real system. And could be looking at things like, for example, if something happens, can you go back and try to understand why it happened? You know, what happened in terms of, for example, power flow that led to that condition? And then you can help them improve the way they operate. That's, I think that's much more realistic as a role for optimization at this scale than to actually have a solution that's going to run the system for them. One, one last comment. It was interesting because these guys, you normally expect that uh, optimization problems or in marketing, you don't normally have money or as, as you trading, trading thing, no? And these guys, they all only need energy. So yep. they have this spreadsheet saying, okay, I owe you this much, you owe me that much, and everything was based on energy. Absolutely. And, and so it gets us back to, to this, this part here. You, know. you can do optimization when you start getting from unit commitment forward, because then you have enough time to do it. The, the interface here where you're you know, less than a day, maybe less than an hour to react, gets very tricky. Gets very, very tricky. Um, and you know, tr truth be told, if I was in their shoes, I probably would do the same thing, right? We, we, we just don't have a tool that's sufficiently reliable. And maybe we can get there with the developments that are happening in terms of power flow and optimization. But again, it's not going to be tomorrow, I don't think. OK, Sorry. sir. <laughs> uh, my issue is here. The investment in transmission lines and its social acceptance, you said. Mm -hmm. Why people are reacting against the investment in new transmission lines? I know HVDC, they, they are very expensive to invest, but what's the social part of it? Why people are reacting against it? Why, why, are, why is it because so hard Canada to get is, things built? Yeah, because Canada is already have a transmission problem instead of a security of supply, you said. Yeah. So why people are against the transmission of the energy? That's a very... That's a very simple question. That's a very good question, but the answer is very complex. Oh. Um, it's, we can talk about it. I don't mind talking about it, but it is complex. It's not my field of expertise. Mm. So I'm also a little bit wary about saying a lot about it. But there is, at least in Canada, uh, a, a major concern about, I would say, the health issues and the environment impacts, the health impacts and the environment impacts that energy infrastructure can have. Let's just put it that way. Whether it's justified is not the issue. The issue is it's believed. And the moment there is a core number of people who are against it and very vocal and very proactive about blocking projects, you've got a difficulty there. Okay. But I'll leave it at that. I'll, I'll be happy to talk about it more um, but it's, it's, it's a very complex issue, and I'm not 
an expert on those aspects. There are people who will know them better than I do. But it's not, it's not simple. That's, that's very clear. Okay. We have another question at the back. So again, I'm going to try to just go halfway through. Thank you. rest of your slides. Um, I understood from your comment before about you have a book of actions. Um, what I understood from that, there's sort of two things. There's optimization and there's automation, that for true optimization, they'd require more automa automation, but we've, we've given up on that. They're, they're not going to accept that they don't trust a tool. Um, well, whether, whether, whether people have given up on optimizing at that you're, you're talking about, for example, the, the actual transmission system operation. Yeah, right? automating more of it. Yeah. Um, I think the answer is going to depend who you talk to uh, and, and where they are. I, I suspect that some people are more open to the idea than others. But traditionally, and for good reason, the people who run the power system are very conservative. Why? Well, because if they screw up, it's a major problem. Right? Basically, if you have a big power cut, uh, you have serious consequences on people's lives. So would I put my trust in a tool that I don't completely understand and trust and that sometimes doesn't give you a good answer? I think the answer is clear. So we have to, if, if, if we want to get there, we have to go, go over those hurdles. We have to come up with something that they can trust, that's reliable, that's robust. And my thinking about it is don't try to bite the whole problem. Take a piece of it, solve that, and create confidence. And then you can work with them towards building a, a tool that will help more automate the whole process. Is but it's, it's not going to be simple. Okay. Is there, I mean, that makes sense to me. Is there regional agreement on that? I can, I can almost understand that California would be much more risk-taking than Germany, for example. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, but it depends on, you know, to what extent either the people running the system are willing to take it on or the extent to which regulators force them to. Because a lot of this is regulated as well. So they have to satisfy the, the requirements of the regulator. So, so if we really want to get into this discussion, the regulator at some point has to be involved as well. Okay. Good. Well, this is this is fun. This is great. And like I said, don't worry about the number of slides. We'll we'll cover we'll cover what we cover. There are some points that I want to make sure that I mention, and and we'll do those. But, uh, but you'll have lots of time during the week to look through them and, and we can talk about them afterwards. As I mentioned, the, the piece that I want to talk about is unit commitment. And first of all, because that is an important problem in its own right. And second, because it's a way to demonstrate different ways of applying optimization to a specific problem. Okay? And of course, you can use the same techniques for other problems. Uh, in, in the area and in other areas. So we're going to talk about optimization models for unit commitment. And the, most of the content on the slides, in fact, all the content on the slides and more, uh, you can find in this, uh, in this publication uh, that just came out last year. And again, if you click on the link, it'll take you to, uh, to the right place. Unit commitment. Unit commitment, uh, I've already mentioned the point of this problem, so to speak, is to look at making sure that we provide enough power generation at minimum cost to meet demand and to have a system that's safe and reliable. So this is where, for example, the issue of reserve comes in. You want to make sure you provide enough backup in case there's a problem. Okay? Because the people who are then making the decision on the spot have to have the resources to be able to, to deal with the problem. So that comes under this umbrella. If I want to write this down as a mathematical optimization problem, it will look something like this. I want to minimize the total cost. That's my objective function. Subject to the first constraint says that the sum of the amounts 
produced, the P's are the produced amounts, generated amounts. So the sum of the production is equal to the demand at every point in time. Then I have to make sure that the amounts that I can produce with the decisions that I've made, these are the P bars, are at least the demand plus the reserve requirements. Okay. There's a distinction between the P's and the P bars. So the P's are the amounts that I plan to produce. The P bars are, is with the generators that I've activated, how much can I produce? So those will always be at least as big as the P's because you can do P. But the question is how much more can you do with the decisions you've made? And that's where you get the reserve and the additional capacity to deal with unexpected changes in, in the demand. Okay. Uh, microphone, there's a question over there. You had a question, right? Yeah. yeah. You just have to lift your hands to catch. It worked. Um, it's for the cost of starting up. What's so the, the cost, um, so you have two types of your costs, right? You have one starting up cost and then one power generation Yes, cost. yes, I'm going to get to that. Ah, okay. Or do you have a question right away? Yeah, it was just saying that this probably depends on, basically I'm not sure how you decouple your system because it seems in time, because it seems that um, these costs depend on your present state of the system and if the generators are already online, then you don't need to consider oh, the costs. Oh, absolutely, yeah, I'm going to get to that. Okay. Yeah, maybe I'll just say, let's move a few slides forward. Okay. And, and by 10.45, we should, we should have gotten there. All right. Thank okay. you. Um, so so this, is the, this is the difference between the P's and the P bars that I was mentioning. And, and the, the, the way to think about this is, before we get to the costs, the way to think about this is that we're looking on a day ahead basis. So I'm planning today for tomorrow. The decisions I make today are which generators will be on and which ones will be off tomorrow. Okay. Now we're talking about, we're not talking about renewables in most cases. Okay, we can, this includes nuclear perhaps, but it includes mostly uh, gas, oil, and, and, um, and um, similar um, cap, you know, generators that you can control. And like I was saying, these are still very relevant. The renewables part typically is integrated here in the demand. So the idea is that if you have wind generation or solar generation, you take it first and effectively you subtract it from the demand. And so the demand here would be net demand, which means you've already accounted for the renewable part of the generation. Having said that, that's not completely necessarily the case and you could consider having renewable generation that you actually decide how much you take in into the system. Okay. This framework allows both approaches. It just says you've got some demand, you've got some generators you can control, and you have to decide which ones are on or off. Okay, which ones will be, will be ready to go or not. Once I've made these decisions today, I'm stuck with them tomorrow. So the critical decision today is which generators are on, which generators are off tomorrow. When I get to tomorrow, I'm stuck with those decisions. And now all I can decide is what are the P's. For the generators that I have online, which quantities each one of them is going to produce. Okay. And those quantities have to satisfy demand and they have to provide enough reserve. Okay. And I want to do this, satisfying all sorts of constraints on how the system works. That's this last generic constraint at the bottom that we're going to dig into. And then I want to do this at minimum cost. So when I produce with generator J, I have a cost corresponding to the amount that it's producing. Okay. And then when that generator J has been, has been turned on, 
typically, again, with, with the kind of generators that, uh, that uh, use um, fossil fuels, you have a cost for turning it on. You could have a cost for turning it off, but in most cases, that's not really considered. Okay. So you want to minimize the total cost that includes what's called startup cost plus the cost of actual production. So when I write this, the implicit assumptions are that I know what these costs are, which is not too bad, but I also know what the demand and the reserve are. And that's especially where uncertainty kicks in a lot in practice. Okay? And I'll make sure we talk about that before my time is over. All right? The cost of producing electricity, as I said, usually uh, we, we have a pretty good idea of what this is. Uh, typically, it's going to be convex, meaning that as you increase the amount that a generator produces, the extra unit of power is more expensive, is at least as expensive, if not more, than the previous ones. Okay? So your cost will generally look like something like this. So this is the, the power that you're outputting, and this will be the cost to output that power. You, you basically start here at, um, well, for the production cost, we'll assume that this starts at zero, although there's the startup cost that I mentioned before, and then this will increase something like that. Okay. So you have, often this is approximated as a quadratic. For computational purposes, if you want something that's linear, you can do it piecewise linear by simply saying, okay, well, I will approximate this with line segments in some way. Okay. And whether they're above the curve, below the curve, intersect the curve, it's up to you. Okay. This is usually not a huge deal uh, as long as you have a reasonable, a reasonable function, you'll get, you'll get uh, a sensible answer out of the, the optimization. And so, so that's basically what this slide is about with some notation involved. Um, what I really want to get into is the operating limits, which were already alluded to in, in previous question. Um, these will depend on the kind of generating units. So if it's, if it's hydro, if it's nuclear, gas, coal, it'll be different, but they all have similar principles on how they work. Um, so generally, you have to operate within some generation limits. You cannot change the power output too fast, either up or down. Okay? There's a limit to how fast these units can react. And then when you turn them off or turn them off, turn them on or turn them off, you cannot change back too quickly. There's some limitation on how fast you can do this. Okay, so these are, these are basic requirements. And to express this, we're going to use binary variables. So these are the on-off decisions. These are the critical, the fundamental decisions of unit commitment. At each period in time, for each generator, I'm going to decide whether that generator is on or off, zero or one. This is my variables V. So V tells me if generator J at time T is on or off. Y tells me if I'm turning it on at time t. And Z tells me if I'm turning it off at time t. Okay. So when I decide to turn on and off generators is the Y and the Z variables. And then the Vs tell me whether at that point, given the decisions I've made on on or off, whether it's actually on or off at that point in time. Okay. Uh, there's a question there. Maybe if we can just get the microphone over. Yep. Is there like a minimum power generation constraint in general? Otherwise, you would never turn off the stuff? There is a Otherwise. minimum power generation if it's on. Yeah. Okay. So it, doesn't, it cannot produce epsilon. It's either off. Okay. Or it has to produce at least yeah. a certain amount. 
Yeah. The, what, what you do in practice is that when you turn it on, it actually takes some time for it to get to that level. So you don't get it online until it's at that minimum level. And therefore, from the modeling perspective, it's on at that point already at that level. I don't know if this complicates the... Okay. So for our purposes, it's either zero or it's going to be at least a minimum amount. Step that it's off, it has actually produced some form of power. It it produces something, but it's not online, so yeah. we don't use it. And and it's not it's it's also a question of reliability because you've got some fluctuation when when it's turning on or turning off. You don't want to go there. Okay. The first thing I need then is I need to make sure that these variables are consistent with each other. So I have this constraint that say for every generator at every point in time um, this combination of y's, z's and v's has to hold. And this basically says that the v's reflect what the y's and z's say. Okay? That's, uh, that's, that's what it means. So for example, if I have that the generator j is on at time 0 and the generator one, uh, sorry, the generator J is on at time zero and it's off at time one, then these are going to require that the Y at one is zero and the Z at one is one. So I've turned it off at time one. Okay? It was on at time zero, it's off at time one, so Z at time one is one because I've turned it off. So I'm just making sure that these things, uh, these things make sense. Now one thing to notice is that this requires knowledge of t minus 1. So when I start my 24-hour planning, I have to know the zeroth hour status. I have to know what my history is in some sense in the previous, in the previous few periods. Uh, there's a question there. If we can just get the microphone, please. Thank you. Dependence on these uh, past decisions. Yes. Then, um, what is the uh, importance of your planning horizon? Because if you use a longer planning horizon, say maybe if you plan for five days or so, mm -hmm. instead of just planning for one day, then um, maybe you can avoid some. Yeah, maybe bad, you bad decisions before. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good point. I mean, how, how far, if I'm planning for 24 hours, do I want to look ahead further? In general, that's, that's the case. For these problems, it's often not so important. And the reason for that is that tomorrow will probably look a lot like today. Six months from now will look very different especially in Quebec or in Denmark, where the weather changes a lot within six months. But tomorrow is probably pretty similar to today. So the, the, you know, the decisions I'm going to be taking tomorrow are probably not that different from the ones today. And that impact is not so significant. Yep, yeah. You have to have some, some transition between Friday and Saturday and, and even Sunday and Monday and so on. But again, when it comes to electricity, those differences are not that big compared to big seasonal differences. So unless you plan very far ahead, which doesn't make sense because this is just a limited time, you don't actually suffer too much from that impact. For this problem, there are other problems where that's very important to, to look ahead and then just, you know, you'd look like a week ahead, implement for tomorrow, and then re-optimize and have a rolling horizon kind of approach. Yeah. Here, I mean, you can do it, but in practice, I'm not sure how different the outcome would be if you do that. Okay. Yes, Jalal. Yep. Uh, maybe it's too early to ask my question, so you can skip it if you like to answer it later. 
So it's about the number of the binary variables. Yes. So here we have uh, three types of binaries, V, Y, and Z, yeah. right? So, um, but I know there are some uh, papers in the literature using only one type of the binaries, only V, mm -hmm. while modeling, uh, I mean, on off, startup class, I mean, startup time, shutdown, everything. So, yeah, there are two types of unit commitment with three types of binaries or just one type. So, maybe you'll like to answer it later when it, or now. I mean, is there any difference in terms of computational time or getting the better, uh, I mean, more optimal solution if you have either three types of binaries or one? Yeah. That, that's a good question. Uh, hopefully, so, so the question is, why do I bother with the Ys and the Zs when I have the Vs? Or vice versa. If I have the Ys and the Zs, I don't need the Vs. I can deduce them essentially using these relationships, right? Um, that's a very good question. And in fact, uh, one, there, like you said, there's, there's at least one paper in the literature, if not more, than say, well, you can reduce the number of variables and, and, and you know, gain from the complexity in terms of the number of binaries. Um, my experience is that that can actually be detrimental. Meaning that if I solve a model like the one I'm presenting here with three sets of variables and one that simplifies the, set, the number of variables, um, the performance for this model with more variables generally is better. Performance in terms of computational speed in, in or... Yeah, in terms of how much time it takes me to get an answer. But the solution is the same. The solution of. is the same, but you can solve bigger problems in the same amount of time. So essentially, it's more efficient. The solution is, I mean, it better be the same. Otherwise, you've got a problem with your model if all the inputs are the same. The question is, how fast do you get a solution out of your solver? So it's so interesting. So it means that in general, it's not true to say that a problem with higher number of binaries is more complex to solve. That's correct. Yeah. Well, OK, let, let me comment on that for a few minutes. Um, all things being equal, the more binaries you have, the more complex, the more work you would have to do to solve the integer problem because implicitly you have to enumerate all the solutions. So, so it makes sense to say, well, if I reduce the number of binaries, I'll have a more efficient model. But that's all things being equal. And what's not equal is the branching decisions. If you have more binaries at each point where you have to decide how to branch, you have more choices. And in some instances, it pays off to have more choices. You can make better branching choices by having more variables. And the result is that you get faster solution, even though you have more binaries. And this seems to be one case where, in my experience, it pays off to have more binaries. It's very interesting. So it puts us in a very challenging status because we should decide how many binaries we should have in different problems. Is it good to have more binaries or no? Try to reduce it. Uh, yep. So we should find a trade-off, I think, right? Or it's, it's essentially yeah, it's, it's some kind of trade-off between do you gain by having more binaries versus simplifying the size of your model? I, I, I still think that in general it makes sense to have fewer binaries. But I think it's good to keep in mind that this is not a theorem. This is a principle. And, and the key point is that when you do integer programming, you still have to make those branching decisions. And that's where, that's really what mostly impacts the, 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 the efficiency of your algorithm is these branching decisions. Um, and and there's, there's another piece of work that, uh, that I've also done with some, with some students on, uh, on, on this problem where you study different ways of branching. You basically use the fact that a lot of these binaries are similar and you can essentially branch in a more intelligent way by using the structure of the problem. And again, you gain even more, even though you have a ton of variables. You can sort of get the structure out of the problem and accelerate your branching. So, so the real question in that sense is, what is the best branching for your problem? But of course, if you know that, you've essentially solved the problem. So it's, it's a chicken and egg.
situation in that sense. But, but it's definitely not true always that fewer binaries is better. Yeah, I think there was a question here. A couple of questions, yeah. I'll be the intermediate on this one. Maybe we'll start closer. Oh, <laughs> careful. Don't want to get some injuries here. Uh, well, I, I wanted to get clarification on, don't you think it's too early uh, to make decision on uh, how many binaries you need to have and how many non-binaries you need to have at this stage when you formulate it? Because one thing is a formulation and another is solutions. And Absolutely. solutions there are many. Absolutely. And there are many techniques which actually would completely reverse yes. your, your decision. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. and, and like I say, if you knew the answer in advance, you've essentially solved your problem. The, the statement, I entirely agree. Um, this is not, and that's why I say in general, I would advocate fewer. But just be aware that this is not necessarily the case. The, the observation that I was making about unit commitment comes from the fact that different people have tried different models and, and have done comparisons, and I've done my own comparisons and tried to understand why I was having this behavior. But you're right, there's no, there's no here's the answer. Because the key point is how is your branching going to be, behave, um, and, and that's essentially, certainly from a theoretical perspective, equivalent to solving your problem. If I knew how to branch, implicitly I've already solved my MIP. So it's, it's, it's kind of cheating. About things beyond branching. So okay, are perfect. Which, yeah. yeah, and that's good too. Yeah, I was, I was focusing on the branching because of the number of variables, but you're right, maybe you can get better cuts and better, better uh, polyhedral descriptions. I guess, I guess this might be related to lifting as well. And if you have more variables, you can get better polyhedral descriptions in higher spaces. Uh, well, there are many other, there are many other things. Yeah, I'll let you. I'll let you talk about that. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, did the solver automatically identify that? In the sense, if you just plug this into an arbitrary solver, did it solve faster with your new binary variables, or did you have to do a custom branching scheme? That's a very good question as well. Um, I had not mentioned that. Of course, a lot of it depends on what the solver does. Yeah. With what so I then, did the solver automatically detect this, or did you have to play around with it? It'll depend on the solver. Which I think it's the solvers. Did you find that it worked with? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, when, when, uh, when testing this, uh, I use CPLEX. Okay. But things have, things evolve, solvers change, but you're right. There's, that's yet another input is what does the solver do with what you give it? And is it smart enough to, uh, to take advantage of what you give it? That's, uh, that's another good point. Yeah. The, the, the upshot is though that you see better performance with more variables. Why that is? Ah, it's time for maybe just, uh, there was another question. There's actually a couple of questions. Maybe we'll just finish the questions and then we'll take a break. Yep. Yes, yeah, so I have a question regarding the scalability of the problem. Yes. Uh, I guess this is a NPR problem probably. So uh, in which, from which instance of the problem that it becomes uh, exponentially complex to be solved and if you do you approach any a special strategy to, to cope with that like uh, mixing mathematical methods with heuristics or that's that's a very broad question it's an important question it's a very broad question uh, it really depends I mean how large you can go really depends on the solver the formulation um, you know, the kind of techniques you use. So it sort of touches on the comments that, uh, that were being made here, uh, that mixed integer programming is, is very, um, there's a very strong component of art to how you do integer programming. There's a lot of theory, there's, there's a lot of good understanding of how the solvers work and the algorithms work, but at the end of the day, answering a question like, you know, how big can you solve with this formulation and so on without actually testing it and knowing a lot about what the solver is doing and what kind of technology you're using behind the scenes. It's very hard to answer in advance. Um, what I would say is that currently, if all you're solving is this basic unit commitment <coughs> problem, uh, which I haven't quite got to. Oh, I see. I got a warning too. Okay, don't worry about that. Um, 
you can solve reasonably large problems. You can probably solve problems that are large enough for practice. The question, though, is that the real interesting problems are the ones that have all sorts of things added on, which is related to also uh, a comment from earlier that you, know, you don't want to just do power flow. You want to do power flow with 15 other things added on to be more realistic. This is going to be the same thing. You want to do unit commitment with a whole pile of things added on. And that's, not, that's where it gets still challenging in practice. So there might be, oh, there's also another one. Maybe I'll just take the questions and then, and then we'll take the break. Yeah. OK, just one question. I, I think you have to use the microphone for the video. OK, just one question. We were uh, discussing at the beginning this quadratic or uh, yeah, me, yeah. Um, piecewise linear um, costs. So I'm guessing in this type of problem, you would normally go between these two, you would normally go to the piecewise linear because you're kind of using integer variables and you don't want to add quadratic, a quadratic objective there. Or what? Yeah, well, if you do piecewise linear, your solver is going to know how to handle it, right? Um, but nowadays, I think that probably most MIP solvers can handle quadratic as well. Just, just as well. So I don't think it's going to have much difference. I would really say go with what, in your opinion, is the better representation. Okay. And I don't think that any solver is going to struggle with one way or the other. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I think there was one last question. Gentleman's been very patiently waiting at the back. Oh, Ooh. <laughs> You're in the um, danger zone, Pascal. <laughs> Watch out. A really basic question to the setup with with Y and Z, is this model assuming that all units start in one time step and stop? There's not a duration. Uh, I'm well, I'm dividing, if I'm doing day ahead, I'll be dividing into, say, 24 <laughs> steps or 96 steps if I do 15-minute steps. I'm taking a day and dividing it into time periods. Right, right. But, so with the, with, but with these three variables, if it's true that it could be reduced to one, it's also saying that there's no... Um, V is one if it's already on, and Y says when it starts turning on. But these yep. are only the same thing if it, if it turns on in one time step. Oh, if it gets turned on at time T, yeah. then both Y and V are one. But right. at the next time step, Y will be zero, and V will still be one. Right, but um, say it takes an hour to turn on, is there not? Uh, whether it's hourly or not, I mean, then it depends on the feature of your, of, your, uh, of your generator, right? So if you say, when I turn on, I have to be on for two hours, then if you're doing hourly steps, you'll say you have to be on for two time steps. If you're doing 15 minutes, you'll say eight time steps. But the time when you turn on is still at this time period here, and that's when my Y goes one. Right. Okay, I understand that. I didn't quite understand that, that Y and V are one at the same time. I thought V was only one if it's already on, not that it's been turned uh, on. When I turn it on, right, well, it's a, it's a bit of a convention. I'm basically putting the convention that when, I, when my Y says one, that means I turn on at that period, the beginning of that time period. It's, I could do it differently. Mm -hmm. But the point is I have one variable that tracks when it goes on and one that tracks if it is on. And those are treated as two different pieces of information, even though they're logically connected by this piece. Right. And so, so V just means it's on without startup time. Without knowing when it was on, when it was turned on or off. Okay. I just know at this point in time, I'm on. And therefore, I can use this unit to provide power. That's what I need. I need to know if it's on because then I can use it to provide power. The other variables help me track the restrictions that I can't just go on and off all the time and so on. Does that answer the question? Yep. Okay. We all done for now? Okay. So it's uh, 5 to 11. We'll take 15 minutes? Yeah, let's say past 11. Okay. All right.